Hey everyone, it's National Master Spencer Feingold. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, just a second. Let me try for a It's Grandmaster Ben Feingold teaching the Tuesday class as per usual. Unfortunately, our topic today is Alexander Alekine and or Alyokin and or, uh, uh, yeah, like that. Um, and, and like that. That's a good Rick and Morty reference. Anyway, um, uh, he was a controversial uh, chess player, to say the least. Um, he gets a lot more credit than he deserves. I'm one of his, let's see, what's, what's the opposite of a fan? Detractor? Yeah. I'm one of the world's leading detractors of Alakine, so I figured I'd lecture on him. That sounds like a good idea. Now, Kasparov said he was one of the finest players ever and that he based some of his game on his play. And Fisher said he was one of the 10 greatest players ever. And the most insane comment ever made by anybody ever was by Levon Aronian, who's known to say crazy things and dress crazy and act crazy. And he said Alakine is the greatest player who ever lived. Okay, Probably he was between 20 and 30 if I had to place him somewhere. But I'd place him somewhere. Um, it's clear that he wasn't as good as Lasker or Capablanca, as the tournament results indicate. But I think a lot of people like his style of play more. Um, although, I don't know, he'd like his style more than Lasker. But anyway, uh, and one of the reasons that I'm one of his detractors is because when I was growing up, I was taught chess by my dad. And my dad is the world's biggest Capablanca fan. Now, obviously, if you like Capablanca... You're not a big fan of, of Alakine because Alakine, you know, stole the title, wouldn't give it back. And, and Capablanca was chasing it, but Alakine was fast, running, you know, this and that. So for those of you who aren't up on the subject, which is at least one of you in this room and all of you at home, in 1927, Alakine played a world championship match with Capablanca. And Capablanca was like, wow, what an easy opponent. And then Alakine won, I believe it was approximately 35 games. I'm within a game. Maybe I'm within two games. And I think he won six to three, but I could be wrong with lots of draws. I could look it up, but that would take valuable seconds. And Capablanca obviously wanted a rematch where he would win. And Alakine said, moved his eyes back and forth, rematch. And instead, Alakine found the worst players to play and still couldn't beat them. Playing Bogolyubov, I think, twice. Ugh. You know why you've heard of Bogolyubov? Because he played matches with Alakine. And, and Karen's like, yeah, Bogolyubov, what are we talking about? But you have heard of the Bogo Indian. I've heard of Bogolyubov. That's because he... done That's right, probably. Yeah, that's right. Because I lectured on him, yeah. Now, and then Alakine lost to Max Irv, of course, because Alakine occasionally drank, like when he was awake. And then, supposedly, he stopped drinking for the rematch. I don't believe that. Now, in the Wikipedia article, which I did read, um, obviously my whole life, before I read the Wikipedia article, I have heard various things about how he died. He was murdered, he died of natural causes, he choked on me, and he died in Portugal, which I did not know, because what do I know? And, of course, a grandmaster who's lived in Portugal for approximately 30 years is the Canadian grandmaster... Kevin Spraggett. And I think he married a Portuguese woman. Anyway, he became interested in how uh, Alakine died and he looked into it. And in his opinion, the, the Russians killed him. Okay. And the main suspect, this is very strange, according to almost everybody, is Trump. I couldn't believe it. It's like Trump killed Alakine? Wow. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, okay, maybe it wasn't Trump, but it could have been like his grandfather. So, um, I don't believe that. I don't think Alakine was killed by the Russians, but I wasn't there. Um, this was in 1946, so it was, as Mr. Burns would say, it was 25 years before I was born. Okay, um, so the official cause of death is he choked on a piece of meat. So, all right, and I could make some South Park jokes, but then Karen would have to get a real editor in here, not the jokers over here. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so today we're going to talk about 
Alakine. Now, Alakine was a good attacking player, um, even better than a drinker. He was a really good attacking player. And also, unlike a lot of people from so long ago, he was very interested in the opening. And for players nowadays, that's about all they talk about. Now, the players in the room and the players watching at home, the opening doesn't matter. However, for the top players in the world, they think it's something very important that they can get an advantage against their contemporaries. And Alakine, and especially Botvinnik later, of course, believe that as well. And before that, you know, they played the opening a little suspiciously, and their annotations of the opening were also suspicious. Somebody would play the most common opening ever, and like, that loses, because he was on move two. Like, King's Indian, what's wrong with you? Although maybe that's true, the King's Indian probably does lose. But anyway, so Alakine did a lot of opening analysis, and not only the opening that's named after him, which he didn't play very often, there's also the, you know, like, Alakine variation in the French, where they play H4, put it in H. The L is that Chartard attack. Yeah, that's and many other openings. Okay, so, of course, he died very young and or was murdered. N nobody knows. Okay, some people think they know, but I don't know. Now, Al Alakine has a lot of famous games, very famous games. And, unfortunately for him, one of the reasons I'm not his biggest fan is... In the 19, you know, 10s, 20s, and 30s, when he played in tournaments with Lasker and Capablanca, you you wouldn't bet on Alakine to come in first. That's not. now if Capablanca and Lasker weren't playing, then then you would bet on him to come in first. Right. Okay. So you know he's sort of the St. Louis Cardinals of, of chess. All right. So en en enough enough. Uh, yeah. I guess we'll just talk about Capablanca the rest of the time. All right. So this was a game he played against Bogolyubov. I tried to find somebody good he beat, but I couldn't. So, no, no, I'm kidding. Um, I think his most famous game is against Rady, but you guys aren't ready for that game, right? Nothing? You know the game I'm talking about. You do, right? Oh. I'm ready. What? <laughs> yeah, you're ready, yeah. But anyway, we're gonna look at a couple other games. We're gonna look at this game, which I'm not super familiar with. I've seen it. Spencer was more familiar. Then the next game, uh, I actually talked about in a lecture earlier, but not the whole game, just the very end. But now we're going to actually look at the whole game. And we're going to show you how people of different levels, made people of lesser levels, look pretty weak. And that's the problem, and it's actually a double-edged sword. So the problem with games that were played between 70 and 200 years ago that we have is a lot of them were very one-sided, which is actually very good for teaching. That guy played good, that guy played bad. Look, nowadays, if I show you a game between Carlson and Caruana, I'm like, yeah, they both play good. You play like that. I mean, you can't learn from that because you guys play bad. So when you play bad, you want to show how you should get punished so you stop playing bad. But if everybody's playing good, how are you going to learn from that? That's why there's the famous book by Irva and Maiden. You can say it all together. Chess master versus chess amateur. Then one guy's giving the other guy the smackdown. That's why when I lecture, I often show my games. Because I'm playing Rufus and Doofus all the time. I'm playing people rated 1,000 to 2,000 like half the time. Especially in my extra rated games. Their moves are all bad. My moves are mostly good, because it's a slow game, not all of them, and then they get the smackdown. So this first game is not the smackdown, but Bogolyubov didn't play very well. The second game, that was, that was a smackdown. Okay, so let's have a look. Alakine was black. Now, according to the internet, so you know it's true, of all the world champions, Alakine had the most decisive games. Unlike today, where like Magnus, I'm sure, has more draws than any player who's ever lived or ever will live. Okay, and therefore he's the greatest ever. But Gary would agree. Now in the Isle of Man tournament, which just finished, you guys know what I'm talking about. Karen knows, yeah? There were two players who had 11 draws in 11 games. That's the way they play chess nowadays. Um, that's actually my only critique of Capablanca. Too many draws. 
Okay, but Alakine, lots of wins. Although playing Bogoyabov, you can see why. Now Bogoyabov had a very famous saying, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. When I'm white, I win because I'm white. When I'm black, I win because I'm Bogoyabov, right? And I, I took that saying for myself. When I'm white, I win because I'm white. When I'm black, I lose. So, truth hurts. Now, the reason I gave you that spiel was because you don't have to draw every game if you don't want to. The players today, they want to draw every game, so it's all draws. Great. Everybody, nobody loses. Okay. Then we have the Magnus Carlsen apologists on Twitter, you know, his PR guys, and they're like, he hasn't lost a game in 100 games or whatever. And my response is, he hasn't won a game in 100 games. All right. <laughs> now, so the point is, if you don't want to draw, Magnus obviously wants to draw every game. An Isle of Man, 11 rounds. How many draws did he have? Probably seven. Okay, and he, and he tied for second. How do you have seven draws, 11 games, and tie for second? What, everybody just draws every game? The, the answer is yes. Okay, so when you play tournaments in the United States, and I've said this in other lectures, you can't draw your games and come in second. Tournaments in the U.S., for the most part, are Swisses. So it's not a round robin where all 10 players are grandmasters, and you can have seven draws and win. It's the World Open, the U.S. Open, the Chicago Open, Foxwoods, National Open. If you want to win these tournaments, drawing all of your games isn't the way to do it. you got to win a lot. Therefore, a lot of the top American players who play in these tournaments over the last 40 years have a very mm, reckless style. Not Gad Reckless, the Israeli GM, you're probably thinking that. But reckless like you got to win. So that's the way Alakine played in this game, because you can't draw a goal, you blood. What? Horrible. Okay, so he played the Dutch. Okay, and there's two openings I hate. Openings that... Are intolerant. Of other openings, openings and the Dutch. Very good. See, he got it. Yeah. You should be a gold member of our club. I'm a fine gold member. Okay, now... Not only did Alakine play the Dutch, which doesn't have a great reputation. In fact, let's ask a quiz to the class here. Large wager, nobody knows the answer. Which American grandmaster hates the Dutch more than anybody? And I mean ever. The answer is John Fedorowitz. If you're his student, you play the Dutch, you're not a student anymore. <laughs> if he gives a simul against a bunch of people and you play the Dutch against him, he yells at you during the simul. Every move. It's like, oh, you're still playing the Dutch. I mean, you already played it. So. Yeah, <laughs> Fedoris does not like the Dutch. Another world champion who played the Dutch a lot was a good class, Botvinnik. Okay, now the reason the Dutch is good is because you get unusual, complicated positions, a favorite of Hikaru Nakamura. He plays the Dutch a lot. And in fact, even Fabiano will play the Dutch if he has to win. Because you don't get boring positions, you get weird positions. The opponent's confused. You! Archer loves that position. The Dutch? That opening. Yes. Yeah? I've never seen him play mm -hmm. the Dutch. He goes, yeah, he goes to the phases where he plays it. He plays the England Gambit. Yeah, he, yeah. That one. Oh, he hasn't mm -hmm. done that one in a while. Go, go Dutch. Okay, now if you play the Dutch in consecutive rounds, what's that called? The Double Dutch. Double Dutch, there you go. There's a guy who's paying attention. Okay. Okay, so they played sort of normal to start. This is, is normal Dutch. It's okay. Nowadays, if a grandmaster plays the Dutch, eh, they're usually not playing E6. They're playing the Leningrad Dutch, which starts with G6, Fianchettoing the bishop. And if not, they can play the Stonewall. One of the players in the last 30 years who played the Dutch a lot as their main opening, which you obviously all know, is Sergei Dolmatov. And the reason you all know that is you've all heard of him. Nobody? No. Mm -hmm. Candidate for the World Championship. Man, harsh. Okay. So he played Bishop B4 check. This is more John Spielman territory, not Rudolf Spielman. Yeah. Rudolf Spielman was a contemporary of Alakine. John Spielman is alive now. Bishop B4 check. Now these positions... You wouldn't expect to see a lot of draws because the positions don't make any sense. Perfect. Okay, bishop d2, I agree. 
You could also take with the queen so your knight could go to c3, but this is okay. Now, normally in the Dutch, especially in the Stonewall Dutch, which hasn't happened yet, uh, these are the bishops white wants to trade. So if black plays d5 and c6, a pawn structure you're familiar with, well, black just trade off his good bishop. That bishop on c8 is not good. But Alkine didn't do that. See? He played knight c6. This is unusual to play it so early, but Alakine's like, I'm, I'm not going to play the stone wall. I got to get my knight out. Let's go to c6. And some people who play the Dutch, they would like to eventually play knight to e4 because you have the e4 square for your knight. Then you might want the other knight to defend e4 with d6. But Alakine's like, no, nah, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. Bishop and knight are already here. Got to get my knight out. I think a lot of grandmasters today, if they had black, they, they would castle first because they're going to castle kingside anyway. Okay, but we have, we have a threat. Yes. Okay, knight f3, did castle, castle. This just looks like normal chess. d6. Instead of d5, black's not going to play for d5, going to play for e5. And this is actually more common in another opening, which we might transpose into. The Bogo Indian or the Nimzo Indian, you play bishop b4 on move 3, or bishop b4 check. You trade the bishops. You play d6 and e5. Black has all his pawns on dark squares. His dark square bishop is in trap behind them. Makes sense. Except in the Nimzo Indian, our pawn is on f7. So f, f5, my, I have the e4 square. I can do a rook lift. My queen can come out. f5 is more aggressive. Black is playing aggressively and getting a non-symmetrical position, also known as asymmetrical, so that there's good winning chances for both sides. And this is why a lot of people really liked Alakine, because that's how he played. Played to win. Unlike players today, who we won't mention, Magnus Carlsen. Oh, wait, I mentioned him. Okay. So queen b3, meh, that's reasonable. If I was white, I would want to push all my pawns. You can't play b4 now because it's hanging. So I might play rook b1 or a3, b4, and start getting my queen side going. Queen b3 is all right. King h8, putting it in h, because we don't want this to happen. Now, I don't like Bogoyabov's next move at all, even though I sort of said I did like it before. I said I wanted white to play b4, and he played queen c3, which has two... Now, I don't like this maneuver of moving your queen there. b4 is a reasonable idea, getting some space, and perhaps he also wants to stop e5 by defending the e5 square. Still... The further you move your queen up the board, the more it can get attacked. So I'm not a fan of the c3 square. Okay, he played e5 anyway. I'm sure you all see the tactical line where you take everything on e5 and never stop taking. And then at the end, this knight is hanging. So why can't just keep taking that? Because it loses knight. So if queen c3 was designed to prevent e5, that didn't work. So he played e3. I don't like that move. Too passive. Unnecessary also. a5. What's the point of a5? I sort of already told you. Preventing b4. Preventing b4. Get space everywhere. Now, you all know what on passant is. And by all of you, I don't mean you at home. I mean you here. And so, in a lot of openings, mainly the King's Indian, but other ones, if white plays a3 to play the move b4... Black could play a4, and then b4 is not going to happen unless you let me take on Passant, and then you have an isolated a pawn. So typically, if you want to play b4, but don't want to allow the on Passant capture, you have to play b3 first. Then you play a3, then you play b4. That's normal. A little slow. Okay, queen e8. Queen's going to h5. I assume a3 went to h5. h4. Ugh. Don't move pawns in front of your king. Now, obviously, white was worried black was going to play g5, g4. If white wasn't worried about that, 
Why is white playing h4? Now, I'm not really worried about g5, g4, because I see this action over here. So g5 opens up black's king, too. So I'm not, I mean, h4 moving a pawn in front of your king is very weakening. Now, what square, and I'm sure you guys think about this often, what square in white's position does h4 permanently weaken? G4. G4, yeah. And you, and you might be like, oh, excuse me, a Grandmaster Feingold and or National Master Spencer Feingold, in case you're confused. You're not giving up g4. If they put something on g4, I could move my knight away and play f3. Now that's true. Not only is it true, but it becomes true. Okay, and I talked to Spando Ballet and they're like, man, even that's not true. Nothing? Yeah. You guys aren't old enough? You're old enough, come on. Okay. See, she got it. Yeah, she did get it. You're like, what? You don't know anything? Can I say anything I just said? This much is true. Yeah, it's this group you never heard of and that's their only famous song. And you're like, that song's famous? Yeah. What? I thought they had a couple. Maybe. <laughs> okay, so... I mean, if I can play knight g4, queen g4, bishop g4, and you can never play h3, you're giving it away. You're also weakening g3. You don't want to move pawns in front of your king. So since white's playing d4, c4, obviously wants to play b4, as he's shown, h4? No. What, what is this, 1922? Oh, wait. Okay. Knight g4, as advertised. Maybe f4 is coming. Then black has a serious attack. Knight g5. Terrible. Bishop to d7. That looks fine. Get the bishop out. Defend the knight. Get the rook into the game. Oh, knight g5. And then f3. Breaking a very important rule which actually was first found out in 1923. That's why they didn't know it. Never play F3. Okay. And if this was a Family Guy episode, and who says it's not, maybe I'll go back in time at some point, and then this game won't exist anymore, because never play F3. Okay, and he retreated. And as you'll have noticed, even though we're pretty early in the game, White's moved all eight of his pawns. Not something you see in Grandmaster play today, these are the kind of games, even if white has a bad position, and he does, he can still win because it's a very double-edged kind of game. And so, sort of like poker and backgammon in this respect, is if you have positions that are rarely drawn at any level, occasionally the person who's not doing well is going to win. And then they think they play great. If you go to a lot of scholastic tournaments... One side plays in a very suspicious fashion, but they win. So they think they play great. So if Bogoyabov wins this game, he's like, man, H4, F3, I know what I'm doing. All right, but nowadays we know better. Grandmasters today don't move all of their pawns because then they have a lot of weaknesses. And there's some exceptions, and those guys lose a lot. Okay, F4, terrible. I understand f4, because white's position doesn't make any sense. White's g3 pawn is weak. Piece, bishop on g2 is no good. You can play bishop g2 to block it with f3. Okay, so f4. Weakening g4 forever. e4. And now black has a free kingside attack, and white's pieces get trapped on the kingside. And white's position is just terrible. In theory, white's bishop is better than black's. In theory, communism works. Okay. Is that Simpsons or Family Guy? I think it's Simpsons. It's Simpsons. Yeah. Okay. So bishop, no good. And later this bishop will become good. Usually in the Dutch, if your pawns are on white squares and you want your bishop to be good, you got to come around that way. But you can also come this way. Okay, and obviously white has more space. White's pawn's on e4, black's pawn's on e3. And so, as white pieces here can't do very much. Knight f1. 
defending the two weak pawns. Knight e7, defending d5, preparing to come here later, and also opening up the bishop and opening up the c pawn. So knight e7 makes sense. Okay, a4 is probably the losing move. Um, a4 and f3, f4 remind me of something I read today on Twitter, just like you guys. It had to do with the kind of psychology lower rated players and higher rated players use when they're playing chess. And the moves like f3, f4, and a3, a4, that's the lower rated player. So maybe Bogolyabov was thinking, well, black could play a4 at some point, or black could play b5 at some point, I'll just put an end to that. I'll just play a4. What does a4 give up? B4. B4. And if you play the Slav with either side, white's getting a nice center, but black gets b4. And black plays bishop b4, and black plays knight b4, and so forth. And here, white probably forgot b4 was weak, because I'm going to go back. Here, the black knight can go to b4, so when black played here, white's like, oh, black's knight can't go to b4. So he played here. And so Alakine played. Yeah. And then white played a3, draw agreed. Yeah. And, I, and So, for somebody like me, a4 is a bad strategical blunder, and I would be yelling at my students that were class D, C, and B. Class A player did that, I'd be pretty mad. This is supposed to be one of the best players in the world, but, you know, 1922. So A4 is very strategically weak because you permanently give up B4. The, white, the black knight can go there, and he probably forgot about it because it moved away. So he wasn't thinking about that. He was thinking, I'll play B4 later. Look at me. Okay? So terrible. So after knight C6, mm, white, white's, white's almost certainly losing. Hasn't lost any material, but he can't do anything on either side of the board. And this is something you won't see in a Grandmaster game today. This pawn structure. Giving up g4 and b4. Forever. Okay, rook d2. I don't know. Bishop h1. Terrible. Queen e8. That's a good move. I like queen e8. The queen on e8 has access to both sides of the board and also gives the knight another square. And the queen on h5, eh, I don't, I think he gave up on that side of the board because black's winning on the center and queen side. And this reminds me of something that Karpov once said, well, probably more than once. I'm winning on this side of the board, now it's time to win on the other side of the board. So on the king's side, sort of a standstill, but on the queen's side, black's played d5 and a5 and knight b4, and for some reason, these pieces are all over here, defending against Black's attack. But Black doesn't have to keep attacking. Black can just say, well, pieces are all over there. I'll go play on the other side. Okay, Rook G2, not paying attention to Queen E8, I guess. He's still defending. Now, again, if I was at a Grandmaster tournament, like the Isle of Man or Gibraltar or World Open, the open section, and I saw this position... I wouldn't think very much of white strength. I would think this is round one and a 2200 is playing a 2600 and they're just getting a smack down. But okay, that's all we had in 1922 was three or four good players, then some doofy. Okay, he takes on C4, opening it up for the bubble up. And now, even though it was 1922, this was the first example of Sophie's choice. They actually made the movie based on this game. Did you know that, Karen? Yes. Yeah, Karen knew that. Okay, and these two are like, what's Sophie's choice? All right, anybody? No? Nothing? Yeah. yeah. I know the idea of it. Terrible. When you have yeah. a choice or two and they're both bad. Right, well, and, and, and now this is good because Sophie's choice is about the Nazis and we got Alakine as black, so that's good. Um, in Sophie's choice, the Nazi tells Meryl Streep, tell me which child of yours I should shoot. So it's a Sophie's choice, because probably neither would be better. Right. Okay. It turned out one of her children was not... No, never mind. Now, so the Sophie's choice is this. you, you got to take that pawn. You can't be down a pawn. 
you gotta take that. But you don't wanna take it. Take with the pawn, then we have a battery on a4, we just take for free. Take with the queen, I have d5 forever. That's a nice square for both of my knights, and a bishop and a queen. Okay, so he took with the pawn, because strategically that makes more sense. Those pawns are pretty good. That could be pawndemonium later. So he decided, instead of saving his a-pawn, to save the pawn structure in the d5 square. I don't know which is better. They're both terrible. Bam! But obviously, if we go back, when Bogoyabov played rook g2, he wasn't thinking about that. Okay. Now he's down a pawn. Knight f2. Very good. Closing in his rook. And b5. Black has more pawns on the queen side. And this is actually a good strategical puzzle for you at home. Um, I mean, obviously, earlier in the game, like two moves earlier, white didn't take on c4 with a piece because that gives the d5 square away. Well, I would still like to play one of my knights to d5. So if I get rid of this pawn, the explosive pawn, then I can play knight d5. b5 seems to do that. Now I get control of d5. Now, by the way, I keep saying black's doing this and black's doing this and black's doing this. Don't forget about that guy. Okay, and that's actually how the movie The Breakfast Club was started. No? Simple minds, don't you forget about me. Come on, you gotta know that. No? Do you know anything? You know what I'm talking about. No, what? I wouldn't have gotten that right. <laughs> but, but, you, but you know what I'm talking about. I do now. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right, now this guy, <laughs> that guy, I'm talking about how black is playing well. But that guy, always play bishop f1. Now we're talking. Yeah. All right, so that, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, knight d1. Knight d3 looks pretty good. Okay. Now this is why the game is famous, because of what happens here. This is, this is what makes the game famous. Before this, white's just playing badly. And on the internet... And with engines, there's been big arguments for a long time, especially since Kasparov annotated this game. And just to understand how bad white's position is, uh, depending on what engine you use, black is between plus 5.5 and plus 9 here. The material's equal. So that's when you know you're positionally not playing well. Now, Alakine played B4. And on the internet, some people are saying that wasn't the best move. Queen H5... Attacking the knight on d1 is the best move. And, the, and taking with check. And the reason is, after b4, you'll notice the queen is attacked. I hope you notice that. And the rook on a5 is attacked. So you can play rook takes rook attacking the queen on e8. You see what I'm saying? But if I played queen h5 and you took care of your knight on d1, and then I played b4... That's the horse of a different color. Now if you take my rook, my queen's not attacked, because my queen's not on e8 anymore. I mean, both moves win, and Alakine's move is more cool. So you got to play that move. Okay. So b4 is the better move for humans. For an engine, maybe queen h5 is better. Winning is winning, I don't care. All right, so the game continued as, as I said. Takes, takes, takes. And now the move that you guys all came for. This is why you're in the class today. And this actually reminds me of the, the Tall Simul game, the game that I really like, where he sacks all his pieces and he plays G7 or something. You with the right answer. C2. C2. Hanging his rook with check. Then he loses king. And that C2 pawn looking pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. Now... You guys are like, well, obviously this is good for black, frankly. Okay. However, if you were good at counting material, not your strong suit, how much is white ahead right now? Two rooks. Two rooks. You guys going to sacrifice two rooks? No. You might blunder two rooks, but sacrifice two rooks. Yeah. But he realizes when he does queen that pawn, the queen's a lot better than those dumb rooks. This, this rook, oh, this bishop. However, this queen and this knight... And this knight, now you're talking. Yeah, that's, that's knight demonium. 
Alright. And this is a very common tactic in puzzles. A pawn on the seventh is threatening the queen on two squares. And of course, if you could put a rook somewhere, you, know, you could you could try to defend those squares, but you can't do that. All right, so he has to let him queen. And he's still bottled up in the corner there where he wants to be. And probably at least 51% of the time, two rooks is better than a queen, but your rooks have to be coordinated and your king has to be safe. Okay, the rook on g2 obviously trapping the bishop on h1. The white king is no good. White's pawns are no, white's got nothing. The rooks aren't, you know, nothing's going on. Now, if I put these rooks, well, if I put these rooks like here, okay, that may be, now you're talking. Okay, knight e1, obviously. Maybe that's why Aronian said Alakine's the greatest player ever. Because of the game Geary Aronian, Aronian plays knight e1. Man, if only Spencer was here. That's one of Spencer's favorite games. Knight e1. Bam. Hope it was knight e1. All right. Rook h2. And then the game ended in a draw now because it's stalemate. Close. Man. Queen takes c4. Man, threatening queen takes knight mate. Damn. Harsh. So he sacks an exchange, and then he plays on for no reason, because that's that's a good reason, right? All right. And then, this is actually funny. Alakine plays king g8, king h8, king h7, because white can't move. The knight on f1 can't move because you hang e3. The king can't move because you hang the knight. Pawns have nowhere to go. They moved a pawn anyway. Yeah, then it was a mop-up operation. Bam! Queen e2. More tactics. The same tactic. You have to take the queen. Now you can stop the queen from queening on both squares with... You can do it. King, king f2. King f2. And the king opponent is easily winning. Okay, and here he resigned. Yeah. That's not the way I would have won the game. but ah. So, um, that game was analyzed by a lot of people, including Kasparov. And the engine says Black played really well after the suspicious opening. Dutch, knight c6. Yeah. But one thing I was told a long time ago by a very suspicious grandmaster was never move pawns. If you move a pawn every move, that sort of breaks that rule. And then he's lost all his pawns and wasn't controlling any squares and so forth. And why Bogolyubov put all his pieces in the corner doesn't make any sense to me. And the fact that he played, what, two matches with Alkine for the World Championship? Come on, horrible. Okay. All right. And last but not least is actually a game that I like because he played like me. You know, when I'm playing a very weak player, not when I'm playing somebody uh, powerful. Okay. And we'll have to flip the board again. This is Alakine versus F.D. Yates. And in this game, Yates made a similar mistake to what Bogolyubov was doing wrong. Too many pawn moves. Okay. Now, first of all, looking at this game, it does look like a game that I would play if I was white. That last game, no. no I wouldn't do any of that. None of that. I wouldn't have sacked my queen. I wouldn't play knight c6. I wouldn't play the Dutch. I wouldn't do any of that. Okay. And then he won because he's the world champion. And then this game, this looks like I was playing. Now you're talking. Okay. White, white in a queen's gambit. Great. I've had white in this position many times. Yeah. Great. Beautiful. Cool. I've, had, I've had white in this position. I've also played queen c2 here. Great. Okay. Yeah, queen c, good. Queen c2 and rook c1. It's like I'm playing. Yeah. So here's what's happening is the players are playing the waiting game. The waiting game sucks. Let's play Hungry Hungry Hippo. Okay. Well, that's Simpsons. Now, the waiting game is Black is going to take on C4 and then play Knight to D5 and trade all the pieces. However, this bishop's on F1, so we're going to wait for the bishop to move, and then we're going to take on C4, and it's going to move again. And Alakine's like, hey, why don't you take that pawn before I move my bishop? So he's playing rook c1 and queen c2. And if he wants to, 
he could play A3 and H3 and keep waiting for DC4. But okay, like Popeye, he had all he could stand, he can't stand no more. And then Yates is like, okay, great, now I can take that. Knight D5, trade all the pieces, agree to a draw. Now, when I'm white in a queen's gambit, and I've had very similar positions, I don't think I've had this position, but I might. And I don't like to play E4, because I like to use E4. Sometimes I mate my opponent, so if I had a pawn on E4, I couldn't do that. Or sometimes I play knight E4, sometimes bishop E4. And so Alakine agrees, and he plays knight E4. Great. And the idea is, if you trade bishops, if black does, when white takes back, he's threatening queen h7 already. And also, he's stopping more trades. Knight e4 stops the trades. And Yates played f5. Very anti-positional. Okay, weakening e6. The bishop is on the diagonal with the king. I don't like f5. Now, you don't get made on h7. That's good. But you're giving up what color squares? What color? The light squares. Close. The dark squares. The dark squares. <laughs> yeah, you put all your pawns, you put your pawns on white squares, you can't protect the dark squares. The dark square bishops are going to get traded. I guarantee it. So you're left with this bishop. Frankly, terrible. Get ready, get set, terrible. That's, yeah. yeah. And Karen's raising her hand. She's like, I never have a bad bishop on C, and it's never happened, right? It happens all the time. Right. <laughs> with, in a lot of queen pawn openings, with a lot of players, their queen bishop sits there, and they're like, what I do wrong? Or in the French defense, etc. Right. This is a very common problem. F5 exacerbates that problem, making sure black can never do anything, that this bishop is just stuck here forever. Okay, so he trades the bishops, obviously. Moves the knight back. Doesn't play knight c3. White doesn't want to trade. White wants to keep all the pieces on the board, so black is strangling himself. b5. <laughs> terrible. And he takes it, which is an unusual move, but it forces black to have no counterplay. Black's counterplay is at some point to play c5 or e5. It's not going to happen. It's not. Now, if this pawn was here, c5 and e5 would both be good. Now, you can't take with the e pawn, your f pawn's hanging. You've got to take this way. That, that bishop's no good. You're not going to play c5 unless you have a magic pawn, then go to c5. And you're not going to play e5 because then you'll weaken all of your pawns and the f pawn's hanging. And it's not your turn. Okay, so castles. A5 I also don't like. And obviously... Of these two pieces, which one is better for black? Which one does black like? The knight. The knight. The knight's controlling the dark squares. So white trades it. Okay. Very suspicious playing a4. Putting all his pawns on white squares with his bishop on c8. I mean, he's British, so what do you want? I was talking to Ginger GM yesterday. He said Yates is the greatest player who ever lived. No. no. It's Michael Adams. Exactly. Now, this is the kind of position that I would have with white if I was playing like a 1200 player. And then people would walk around and look and be like, why is Ben playing a 1200 player, number one? Number two, how come Ben's not a material? Like, it's equal material and the guy's 1200. The 1200 player is like, man, this looks like a draw. It's like everything's equal. He's 1200. I'll give him a break. Okay, now for Grandmaster... They would never have black in this position because there's one open file and white has it forever. And you can't protect e5. That's no good. And this is the worst bishop ever. So every, everything is the worst thing ever. Like black, black has no plan. You. It's not funny. <laughs> is it, isn't um, his name Fred, <laughs> Frederick? Divorced. He's divorced? Yeah. Is that what your point is? He's divorced. Yeah, the worst. The worst. That's his middle name. Yeah. The truth hurts. I recall from the lecture. The, the truth hurts. Yeah. Right. Karen's making Who says that we don't learn things here? That's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Now, I've never shown this whole game 
which is good because you know I'm pretty suspicious. But the end of the game now you're now you're talking. This is the part I do show. Not yet, but close. Okay, B four, double up on the bubble up. Bishop A six, ninety five, B eight. Okay, F three. Never play F three. Now, when you play F three in this pawn structure, normally, normally there's two reasons. You're gonna play E four, or you're gonna play G four. In this position, neither one of those is the reason. The reason can only be known by Grandmaster Nigel Short. That was a hint. No, that wasn't a good, was that a good hint? Did you like the hint? He's gonna get his king up. So you like that hint? Yeah. Oh, you're like, oh yeah, short Timon. Okay, yeah, and if white moves his king up, maybe black can stop it, but I don't see how. So, I've dominated the C file, my knight dominates your bishop. The only thing that's not is the kings are on the same square. And again, in the psychology study that was published today, this is the problem you have. You're like, wow, my rooks are good. Rook c7. Wow, my knight is good. Knight d7. Okay. And a grandmaster says, well, my king's not good. Let's make my king good. And then they pretend they're playing bug house. Take a piece from make that piece good. Just keep making pieces good. Reminds me of a Stu Younger story. Your favorite poker, um, uh, what's the name of that game? Not Hearts. Gin Rummy. So Stu Younger is the greatest Gin Rummy player ever, and he got too good. Nobody would play him. So he started playing poker. And many people think he's the greatest poker player ever. He's not, but a lot of people think that. And he was playing in a poker tournament, and behind him was a Gin Rummy tournament. He couldn't play in that because they wouldn't let him play. And so he's playing his hand, and a friend of his was playing gin rummy, and he finished the hand, and he turns and says, what did you think of that? And he, the guy was sitting behind him, looking the other way. And Stewie turned around and says, I thought you should have done this earlier. So, even though he was facing the other way, playing a different game. So, yeah. Okay. And so, you, you, you got you to do every. You, now, obviously, in gin rummy, to be good, as opposed to be a random person, you have to know everything that's ever happened ever. You have to know all the cards in your opponent's hand. If I play with my mom, like when I was a kid, I could barely see what was in my hand. Okay, but, all right. So you can't just do one thing. you got to do everything. So you got to make Black's pieces terrible, which he did, and you have to make your own pieces better. You can't just leave one piece and be, yeah, that's okay. One piece bad is good. You make it better. Okay, and he blocks it up on the bubble up. Here he comes. Walking down the street. Here comes his king. Black can't move at all. And again, just like in the last game when white's rook was on g2 and bishop was on h1, this is not a position you would see today. This is a game you can learn from because white got the c file, white got the better minor piece. White got the better king. If grandmasters are playing today, they know this is going to happen. So before it happens, they don't do that. They wouldn't play a move like f5. I mean, after f5, my king can come here. My knight can come here. Trading on c5 gives me the c file. Putting all my pawns on white squares, my bishop can't do anything. <laughs> Terrible. Okay, always play bishop f1. Okay, good. And now he wants to mate him on g7. Rook here, rook here, rook g7. Okay. Goes here. What's he going to do if black, if white doubles? Rook g8. Rook g8. Okay. All right. So the king went up the board. The rooks went up the board. The knight hasn't moved in a long time. Very long time. So knight d7. What's the threat? Knight f6. Knight f6 check. Easy to stop except for one thing. It's not, easy. not easy to stop. <laughs> so there is only one move that makes any sense at all. King h8. King h8. Now knight f6, you can't take it because the rook h7 mate. You see what I'm saying? You want to take the rook. If the rook moves away, you take on g7. But Yates had it all figured out. He wrote a poem. Oh wait, wrong Yates. 
he played rook f8. He said, ha ha, you can't take on g7, I'll take the knight on f6. And Aliakin said, no talking. Okay. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, but he did it anyway. Now, if the black rook was on f8, which it's not, either rook, doesn't matter. Then I play rook h7 check, repeat, and then rook g7 mate, always repeat. So Alakine finished the game, and I've lectured on this game before. King e5. King e5. Attacking the rook, I just said, if either rook goes to f8, you get mated. Probably you want to play rook f8. Either one. Otherwise, I take your rook. Now, Yates, even though it says he's divorced, he found a way to avoid mate and not lose his rook. Resigned. He resigned. Yeah, that'll, that'll do it. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm going to take your rook and then mate you. Yeah. So that was a very modern kind of game from Alakine. It wasn't like he sacked all his pieces and mated him or got a mating attack out of the opening. That was a positional brilliancy. Took the C file, took the dark squares, made his opponent's game bad, moved his king up the board. This is the way I like to play. I'm not sure I would have sacked a piece because I don't like sacking a piece. So sack the piece at the end, there was like nothing to calculate. So, Rook F8 is mate. So. And so I've shown the end of that game before, um, but never showed the whole game where Yates didn't play very well. Now again, we can't really compare the games to 100 years later where people play better now because we got to look at these games. I mean, that day, I know I read about it, Yates' chess base wasn't working. It didn't work. It didn't ever work. Yates could never get his chess base to work. So he didn't, you know, he didn't know the opening very well, you know. And also he was British, so he can't, yeah. And if you're not sure he was British, I can prove it. If you can see, I don't know if you can see because it's pretty small. The tournament with London, London. That's two Londons. Yeah. I don't know why chess base does that. Sometimes it names the city twice. Yeah. So Alakine, as you can see from those games, good attacking player, good strategical player. Uh, didn't have a lot of draws. I showed you two decisive games, obviously. And, again, one of the greatest players ever. I'm not his biggest fan ever, but that's okay. Not to be somebody's biggest fan. And probably it would have been more interesting for everybody, including Alakine, if he had actually had a rematch with Capablanca. Then, then I could have shut up about, you know, he wasn't in Capablanca. If he'd be Capablanca again, what am I going to do? We'll, we'll never know until we go back in time and get, you know, machines that play like them. Then we'll know for sure. Yeah. All right, that's all I got for you today. It's 8. Don't be late. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Go Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta. I'm either National Master Spencer Feingold or Grandmaster Ben Feingold. I'll look at my wallet and find out. Bye.